Hey, what's up, guys? Um, so I had a request to make a video about rehab, detox, what to expect, the good and the bad, because it's uh, it really depends on where you go. It depends on your insurance. It depends on how the facility runs their program. You know what I mean? So to start. I'm going to say it starts with the fear, obviously. You know, everybody's like, oh, no, I don't want to go to detox. I, You know what I mean? I've heard things, this, that, and the other. You're gonna, you, I'm sure you've heard millions of different things, you know what I mean, about rehabs and detox. And um, <clears throat> the crazy part is, is a lot of it is true, and a lot of it is also based off of the other person's perspective and <clears throat> their attitude towards getting clean. It's, that's why <clears throat> you don't like, <clears throat> you don't take what every person says as this is what it's going to be like. That's the one thing I say first, don't do that. You know what I mean? Do not, you know, <clears throat> base your your decision off uh, what 30 other people said because a lot of the times they're not ready you know they're, they're they go there just to some people go f for a number of reasons like uh, people go sometimes to lower their tolerance to their drug so they can go back out and save money by using less of it and getting just as blitzed then there's people that <clears throat> You know, have to do it for court reasons or, you know, drug core, like things like that. And then there's people that say, you know what, I can't do this anymore at home. I can't. I'm going to give it a go. And they still don't make it when they go in. You know, they still leave the AMA. So, and then there's those people that follow through and finish. You know what I mean? Now, I've, I've had my stents in rehabs. <laughs> 10 days, 30 days, 6 days, I've done all of that, you know what I mean? Uh, I've been to quite a few of them myself. So, <clears throat> it's not, like, I could tell you straight up, you know what I mean? Out of the, out of all the places I went, there's just one that I succeeded in, you know what I mean? Like, that I, I followed through with, you know what I mean? Um, oh, but there's other ones, <sighs> Like, the one I said in one of my videos in the past about, like, wanting to sue them. Uh, because they, they weren't giving me the Zoloft I was on. Or my thyroid medication. And gabapentin I have for sciatica. <laughs> so, yeah, I crashed over there. And it was down in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. So, think about that. Uh... Yeah, it's it, it wasn't pretty. I mean, there was one bathroom, you know what I mean? And you had to pretty much go through, I guess, really, one bathroom. Nobody's rooms had bathrooms. You had to run to the bathroom. And I'm talking, you had to, hold on, it's telling me to update. I'm going to snooze that real quick. There you go. Um, you had to run to the bathroom, you know what I mean? And most people couldn't even make it to the bathroom. They ended up going on the floor. And... Nobody was cleaning up their feces and urine, so... And on top of that... <laughs> the, uh... Like, they had the worst air conditioning system ever. And I do air conditioning work. Like, I have did it for many years. It was terrible, you know what I mean? The air quality... The whole place smelt like black and mild cigarettes. Those clove black clove cigarettes, the black ones, uh, <clears throat> it smelled like a mixture of every type of cigarette or cigar you could ever, you know, smell. Um, and I found that out by when I had to go to the bathroom and I went in there, there were about 10 guys in there smoking their cigarettes and their whatever up in the vents and, uh, blowing them through the vents. So the whole building smelled like what they were smoking. And, uh, we weren't even allowed, like, outside this place like we, we couldn't like go outside and you know what I mean get some sunlight like we were out maybe like maybe twice a day and it was only for like 
15 minutes. So, it, and it's, it was hot, you know what I mean? Really hot. Um, plastic on the mattresses and the pillows. Sweating, sticking, no. Um, <laughs> and uh, they put, you know, those f like when people mop the floors, they have those floor fans. They were putting those outside of people's rooms and blowing them into their rooms because the, the ventilation, the system was just so bad. Um, so it's like there's feces and urine on the floor and that smell is, ble it's being blown into our rooms. Like it's legit being blown into our rooms. Like we, were, it smelled like death. And uh, I remember like starting to crash, you know what I mean, from the Zoloft, and I was like, oh my god, like, I, I was like, why am I the only one here that's not feeling any better, everybody else is seemingly getting, you know, better, but I'm not, and that's why, you know what I mean, I brought my prescription for Zoloft with me, The guy, I brought all the paperwork, everything they needed, so they had all the stuff, they had everything they needed to prescribe it to me and keep me on my prescription, but they decided to rip me off that cold turkey, um, so that, that wasn't nice, uh, no. Uh, and I, what was it? Another thing was like, uh, oh, there were no screens on the windows, and the, they were push-out windows. So we're near Camden, New Jersey, and like, I'm not saying that's where I live, but this is where I was at that place. Uh, pretty much Camden, you know what I mean? So the people there were 90% criminal. And, like, I'm, I'm used to that, all right? I'm, I, I'm cool with people. I was cool with people there, too. Some of them I, uh, some of them were, you know, cool people. Um, some of them I've seen at other rehab. You know what I mean? I'm like, hey, I was with you here or whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but anyway, no, no screens on the windows. A raccoon could have crawled inside the room in the middle of the night or the day, and you wouldn't even notice. Like, it, that, that's how crazy it was. Um, and it was humid and hot, and I'm like, why are you, like, because it smelled so bad with the air conditioning, they decided, like, to keep windows open, and then at the same time, keep that nasty smell going. Even the food tasted like cigarettes. That's how, that's how bad it was. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, so, but then, like, there was another place I went that, uh, I, I had been to before, and this is the one where I followed through, you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> we had, you know, we had TVs in our detox rooms. We had, dude, pool table, ping pong, Xbox One. I don't play games, but Xbox One, uh, you know, big TV, all these DVDs to watch, cool techs, you know what I mean? Everybody was helping everybody. I mean, it was amazing, you know what I mean? Um, it was a good experience, you know? Um, <clears throat> and another thing... That, um, it's kind of, it's really tough, it's really tough, th this part's really tough, and I personally think all rehabs should do what the place, I'm talking about the good one, they should do this, but most of them don't, because they're complete morons, in my opinion, like, you, you have to be a complete moron to not follow this protocol in terms of benzo uh, benzodiazepine so like if you're coming off let's say xanax you know alprazolam it's short acting benzo you know yeah the withdrawal might suck you know depending on how much you're taking like if you're popping like five six bars a day i mean it's 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 not going to be too fun uh <laughs> um you know if people keep taking higher doses and higher dose that's when withdrawal really you know what I mean? When you keep going higher on the dose to the point where you're at an insane dose. Um, the best thing that they did at the good place, I'm going to mention, I'll call it the good place, uh, is that they switched, you know, to a longer acting benzo, like Librium. They put you on Librium and you don't feel any symptoms of the, the withdrawal from the, the benzos. You know what I mean? It takes the edge off as much as you can, depending on how much you were taking, because they don't go based off of your tolerance, you know, that's the one thing that does suck, but you got to deal with it, um, that's why they mix the clonidine with it, because it balances it out, but, switch you to a longer acting benzo, you know what I mean, so after 10 days or so, you know, you come out and you have, you're off your, your Xanax, let's say, we'll, we'll use that benzo, because it's one of the more popular ones, um, and, you know, if you're coming off opiates too, it's, 
it helps. You know, they give you a librium, you calm down, you relax a little bit. Um, different experience when you're in rehab, uh, detox slash, slash rehab. Um, now here's the, here's, here's the crate. Here's another crazy thing, right? And this is at the good place. People will say, you know, when you're in detox rehab, it's easier because you don't have access to you know, your drugs, whatever. That is partially true. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. Like I said, it depends on where, when, and coincidentally who's there. You know, who the who the patients are. You know what I mean? I was in an H&I meeting, and um, some guy just got checked in, in scrubs. He was in scrubs, so, you know what I'm saying? He was checked, scrubs, everything. This guy starts, well, what we thought was falling asleep, this guy ends up falling. I mean, fall, like, he was about to fall off his chair. And uh, he was just sitting there, you know, like this in the meeting. And, um, you know, somebody signaled to the nurses, like, come here, you know, quick. Like, this guy's overdosing. So check this out. As the guy's leaning over, about six or seven bags of brown and white powder fall out onto the floor. This man had quite a lot of stuff on him. How? I mean, I really don't know. You know what I mean? The only time I ever snuck something into rehab was, uh, I snuck a, it was, a, I think it was a Xanax bar, and, uh, I think it was like a Xanax bar and two Clonopin. And it was just because, uh, you know, Think I have really bad anxiety problems, so I figured with with their with their librium, I would just you know break a little piece off, take it, and give me a little extra relaxation. I mean, like I'm not like a benzo head, so it's like I was just like, eh. You know what I mean, my tolerance wasn't high. I just pissed positive for it because I think I, I had like a panic attack or something a night or two prior, so I had taken one just because of that reason specifically. But it was in my urine, so. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's, that was it, you know what I mean? And I did, it wasn't, you know, I knew they were prescription, so they weren't like, uh, press pills or anything, but this guy, I mean, six, seven bags of, I don't know what, but it had to be dope of some sort. So yeah, um, people do bring stuff in. They do try to get high, uh, in different ways. Some people, uh, like for instance, all right, so let's get back to the point. <laughs> um, all right, so from step one, you call the rehab, they answer the phone. Hello, this is <clears throat> so-and-so, whatever. Hi, I'm whoever you are, uh, calling for myself, I'm trying to check myself in. I have this insurance, hopefully if one of you guys have the insurance. I have this. Um, You know, I'm doing opiates, whatever. And then um, pretty much they're going to screen you over the phone a little bit, like ask you questions like, you know, what you're taking, how much you're taking. Please be honest. All this and I'd be honest with them. Seriously, be honest with them. Don't don't tweak stuff like, oh, do like five bags a day if you're doing 15. Don't. I'm telling you right now. Because that's going to mirror... The treatment that they give you you know what i mean like what meds you're going to need because they're going to see how bad your, your withdrawal might be now like my previous videos we really don't know because we don't know how much of what's in what you know um they're going to tell you yeah there's a two-week waiting list or a month they're going to tell you something like that and i'm telling you right now this usually happens like more than like 75 80 percent maybe close to 90 percent of the time this always happens you get a call within the next day or two a bed is open are you ready you tell them yes get there however the hell you get there sometimes they send uh you know part of their program will come pick you up 
Um, so you go. <clears throat> you start to get a little nervous. You know, oh shit, where am I going? I feel like I'm getting sent to war. And you kind of are in a psychological and physical sense. You are going to some type of a war with yourself. So you get in there. It's your first day, right? See all these people coming in. Um, new people, whatever, they, um, strip you, not like naked, but they check you and, you know, see if you brought any stuff with you, they run through your bag, they check everything, um, and then when you're good, uh, pretty much, you gotta pee for them, give them your urine, they see what's in your urine, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and then it's time where it's like, alright, you, you're pretty much waiting out in a waiting room. A lot of the time, like, you're waiting in this, you know, this room. Depends on where you are, like I said, I don't know. But you're waiting in the room, and you're waiting to get called in, and one of the techs brings you in, shows you your room. <laughs> and you're in 12B, or whatever. Okay. You go into the room, bed's made. Now... This, like I said, this is more like state insurance type rehabs. It's not really like POP, like private insurance, nice <laughs> places that people go. Um, this is like state ran rehabs because a lot of us, you know, we have state insurance or no insurance, and some people still help. You know, they still let in. So you get in your room, and you'll notice the beds are not that great. They're like jail beds, you know what I'm saying? They're thin mattresses most of the time. Uh, the comforters are like definitely not comforting at all. Um, Penny, what are you doing? Hold on, my dog. What is she doing? All right, guys, my dog uh, was about to pee on the floor, and uh, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> Let her go pee pee. Um, anyway, so you get in your room, and it's like I said, it's not the Sheridan thin beds. Uh, the comforter, usually they give you like one little thin comforter and a little sheet. Uh, one pillow, which absolutely blows. I If I had no roommate or something, I'd take that freaking pillow right off that other bed. Um... You know, and you unpack, you you know, there's a dresser there or something. You can put your clothes, a closet, whatever. So you start unpacking, put your stuff away. And, um, then it begins, the wait. So, you, you know, before you go to the nurse or the nurse practitioner, you got to meet them because they're the ones that are going to pretty much, like, dictate the medications they're going to give you, like they're going to, you know what I mean, that usually goes through Zoom calls and stuff like that, so it might, you know, they might have you on a Zoom with it, or they're, they'll come in, you know, whatever, and um, pretty much after that, like you're, you know, you're going around, you're, you're waiting to see the nurse practitioner, you start meeting people, you know what I mean, you start, hey, how are you, I'm Dan, I'm from whatever, or whoever you are, you say, hey, I'm so-and-so, um, you know, <laughs> I'm here for this, and they're going to be like, oh, I'm here for that too, or I'm here for this, like, the, whatever, you know what I mean? You're, you're going to start mingling with people, you're going to start talking to people, you're going to start, the camaraderie begins, you know, hopefully, you know, if the group that you have, that you're with, all the, however many people, 30-something people on the floor, um, you know, hopefully they're good, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there's bad shells and goods, you know what I mean? I mean, I've, I've had my bouts with uh, some people, you know, I had a, I pinned a guy against the wall once because he was, you know, I was in withdrawal and he kept freaking, uh, I forgot what he was nagging me about, but he like pushed my shoulder, like kind of tried to push my shoulder and I just held him against the wall and I was like, you put your hands on me again, I'm telling you right now, I was like, you will sleep through this detox. Like I was mad, you know what I mean? No one seen it, no one saw it, which was thankfully, he, oh, okay, don't do that to me, you know, because I'm an easygoing guy, I was, I'm very calm, you know what I mean, even going through withdrawal, I'm very calm, 
Um, and then there's good, you know what I mean? There, there, there's good people you're gonna you're gonna talk to and be like, wow, where have you been all my life? Like, it's so weird. Um, but get in where you fit in. Don't like don't treat it like jail or prison or you know what I mean? It's, this ain't the county. Like some stuff might remind you of the county, like the cafeteria. You know what I mean? They'll be like, you know, detox over here. Uh, residential over here. You guys sit on this half. This other people sit on this half. Like they're gonna say stuff like that. Um, there's gonna be cool texts. You know what I mean? There's gonna be boring ones. There's gonna be annoying ones and mean ones. There's gonna be. I'm just stating everything so you know because each facility is different. <laughs> so you're meeting people. You know what I mean? You go to your room a couple times. You come out, whatever. And uh, most people they get high before they go in. Um. Like I said, the, the, that's when it begins. You know, you wait. So the first day is going by. You see your nurse practitioner. They say, okay, we're going to give you your first set of medications at this time. And usually, the medication, like for, for detox, um, it's usually like a every three, four hours. You know what I mean? They, they, they keep on you pretty good in the beginning, especially like the opiates and benzos. Like, they'll wake you up, you know what I mean, they'll give you your meds before bed, 10 o'clock, you will you know, they'll wake you up at 3 in the morning and be like, hey, med time, come get your meds, you get your vitals done, you know, whatever, then if you need more medication, you know, they're going to give it to you, and uh, they're going to keep doing that until it's time for, let's say, opiates, your buprenorphine, because nowadays they're making you wait 3, 4, sometimes 5 days, some, some people are like, dude, my detox is done already, now you're giving my you know, you're giving me my suboxone, like, they do that because of the whole fentanyl thing, so, I guess, you know what I mean, whatever, but, <laughs> they give you, you know, comfort meds until then, and, um, usually it's, it's, it's not too bad, you know what I mean, it, it really isn't, you know, the benzo with the clonidine, you know what I mean, the, the visceral for the anxiety, the, they'll give you all these different types of meds, and some of them, like, you might not want to take because you don't want to be like a walking pharmacy and you're going to have, like I had side effects once. I think it was from the, the Remron or the Bistral. I'm not sure. I started slurring my speed. I like, got playing like this. They're like, what? They're like Billy Crystal and freaking analyzed that. Like when he took that freaking Xanax and he was at the table like, Ugh. like I was like, what the hell is this? Like in my head, I knew you know, I could speak normally in my head. I'm like, why is this happening right now? Why am I slurring? So, like, I had side effects or whatever, but, like, you know, it went away. But I would take, you know, the comfort meds that I needed. If they offered it, I'm like, fuck, sorry, guys. I'd be like, that's it. Just just give it to me, whatever. I want to get through this. Um, get on my Suboxone if I decided to take the Suboxone that time, whatever. Um, now, precip happens in there. I ain't gonna lie to you guys, it does happen. There was a time I was in rehab, I got my dose of Suboxone, I went into precip, I AMA'd, right? This was at the good place. I left the building, a bag in my hand, my clothes. And there was another guy that left with me, and he was like, yeah, we'll go out together. And my stupid self, no, okay. So we left, whatever, with no way to get home, pretty much. He had 2% battery. This guy was snorting Wellbutrin, because I mean, I'm not going to bring that part up. You guys do your own research on that, but he was doing that, and I'm like, what are you, ugh, what the hell are you doing, dude? And he was like, I got 2% battery on my phone left. He's like, make your fucking phone call. Sorry for cursing. <laughs> make your phone call. And I'm like, all right, make the call. I think I called my mother. No, I called my father first. He said, I'm putting down concrete. It's about to rain, so call your mother because I'm, I'm busy right now. Okay. Call her up. I mean, I'm going through precip, you know what I mean? So I, it was like, ooh, it sucked. And, um, the, these two girls pull, I don't know, they were going to the, uh, rehab that was connected to it across the way, and women are there. And, um, 
I said, look, can I just use your phone real quick? You know, I, I just got discharged. I, I just need to make a phone call. You know, they asked, where's your phone? I was like, uh, they're holding it for 72 hours because I left, you know, a little too soon. I'm, I told them I'm in precip. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, here. Ring, doesn't answer the first time. Ring, doesn't answer the second time. Ring, answers. Hello? Hi, uh, I lied. I said, uh, there was an issue with my insurance. Uh, they're not going to cover the whole stay, so they discharged me today, whatever. I just talked to your counselor. You're not going anywhere. Get back in that building. Uh-oh. Now, mind you, I'm friends with the head of this freaking building. I know the guy that runs the whole facility. Apparently, he was informed about me going, but they understood because of the precip thing. Right? I go back in there, buzz myself in. They look at me. Dan. Tech comes in, same guy that brought me in when I first got there. This was like in, this was like three days in. Nothing. Get back in there and, you know, luckily, they put me right back on schedule. They didn't restart me at day one. They put me right back in my room and continued my medication. And I was like, all right, that's pretty cool, whatever. Got more comfort meds. I'm in precip, so I'm sitting there like, Ugh. They give me another two milligram Suboxone to try to level out the precip. Gets worse. The precip and the situation. <laughs> because after that, everybody starts talking. And I'm like, what's all the worry? Why is everybody so spooked right now? I'm sitting there shaking, shivering. <laughs> it wasn't like you know, like, diarrhea and all that type of precip. It was just, like, hardcore sweating and all that what jazz, whatever. And I'm talking to the guy, one of the guys there. I said, what is going on? They ran out of Suboxone. Come again? There's no Suboxone. Come again? I was like, uh-oh, this ain't good. So I have to rely on comfort meds. So they gave me a higher dose of Librium, I think, another Clonidine, Vistra, everything they could give me to freaking calm the hell down because I was, my BP, my pole socks, I mean, I'm telling you right now, it was, it was bad, you know what I mean? Um, so I literally rode that precip out until it was done and, uh, didn't have any more Suboxone after that, so the rest of it was just cold turkey. It was terrible, 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 terrible. Um, now, another thing, let's get back to the, you know, the point, right? They're going to assign you a counselor. This counselor, he or she, is going to, if they're doing their job the correct way, because I've had my bouts with bad counselors, and I'm telling you right now, they're going to make you feel like you're crazy, some of them, and make you feel like a psych patient. Like, you're going to be like, you know, why are you doing this? Or why why, why are you doing that? Like, they, they, you know, they, they call, like, if you put, you know, your relatives' names on the sheet, you know, to uh, that they can communicate with. And my advice is, like, don't do that. Just don't put anybody down. If it is, make it like somebody that understands, like a friend. But, um, yeah, I made a mistake putting, you know, my mother down and all that stuff. And my aunt and my dad and this freaking counselor is calling them behind, when I'm not even with them, calling them behind my back. Mind you, this counselor did not ask me my story. He didn't talk to me, really. He didn't. He didn't know me at all, you know, and he's calling them, uh, I don't think your son's ready yet. Like, I, I don't think he's, this was like day 15. This is another time I was there. 15, 16. And I'm like, I'm sitting there. Cause like, you know, he brought me in whatever. And, um, let me make the phone call. I made a phone call and I was talking to my mother and She's like, yeah, he said, he, uh, you're not ready yet, and, and all this, and I straight up 
like, like I'm an easygoing, calm guy. I turned into a complete hard ass here. I was like, I was like, who told you that? And she was like, your counselor. I looked at him in the eye and I was like, he's never asked me once how I was doing. He's never asked me. I'm looking at my counselor basically right now. I'm like, he, he, he doesn't know my story. This is my second time in his office out of the 15 days that I've been here or 16. I was like, he doesn't even know me at all. I was like, so who is he to sit here and tell you that? You know what I mean? Like, I, I was pissed. You know what I mean? Because they get paid if you decide to stay longer and longer and longer. They get paid. You know what I mean? If you go to the other side, to residential, you know what I mean? Or uh, you're in residential and you get an extension of 30 more days. Some people don't want to do it. You know what I mean? And it's it, you're not going to force them to do it. So the counselors will try, though. I'm not going to lie. Like, they're going to try their hardest to to keep you there if, if they're the non-compliant counselors, the, the bad ones. And then there's the good ones. Like I had, uh, when I was there, uh, I saw one of my old counselors that I had from the last time I was there. And I was like, oh my God, Jen. I was like, oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. And she's like, are they treating you okay? Is everything okay? And I'm like, eh. I was like, uh, you know, my counselor, I said his name, Chris, I think his name was. And she was like, ooh, like, oh, I'm so sorry you have him. You know what I mean? He, he does stuff, I, I hope, I don't even think he's there anymore now, but, um, it's been, it's been, it's been a while, I don't remember, he might have left, I don't know, he might have got fired, um, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean, you're gonna get assigned a counselor, they're gonna bring you in, they're gonna start asking you, you know, what's your future plans, uh, do you have any plans for aftercare, and they're gonna do all this stuff, whatever, you answer the questions, and they're gonna let you go back into your detox ward, go in there, you're hanging out, now day two comes and uh you start to feel you know you're, uh, you start the yawn and the stretching and you know like after that you know sweat breaks and you know the symptoms slowly start to creep in whatever and um you know they're gonna medicate you to make sure that it doesn't get to a point where it scares you you know the withdrawal like, you can be like, uh, and they give you the clonidine and all that stuff and then you know you'll You'll be, you'll be all right. You know what I mean? You'll be okay. You get through day two. Day three comes. Usually one of the harder days. Um, and they're going to tell you, you know, we can give you a cow scale. This is for opiates. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do the cow scale. We'll check you out. We'll see if you're ready for buprenorphine because, uh, you know, it's risky with the fentanyl and all that. So... They're going to do the cow scale on you, check you out, look at your eyes, your pupils. They're going to, you know, ask you if you have piloerection, goosebumps. They're going to ask you if your blood pressure, you know, is high. They're going to take your vitals. They're going to, they're going to do everything. <laughs> but if you're not, like, if you're even a point off, like, they're going to be like, no, we're not giving it to you yet. Which is BS because you actually do not need to have every single symptom. I mean, every single, um... Like the cow scale, you don't have to have every single, you don't have to meet every ounce of the criteria. You just like need to have a certain amount. As long to me, if your pupils are big and you have the sweats and the chills and your stomach's killing you and you're craving and all that, you're ready for your buprenorphine. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like day three comes and they're going to do that and they're going to be like, look, wait one more day. Just wait one more day. And you're like, oh my God. What's it going to be like tonight when I lay down? Am I going to sleep? I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? You're going to start getting nervous. So somehow you make it to day four. Induction day. And, um, you know, they're going to nine the morning meds. They're going to look at you and say, all right, I think today we're going to give you your Suboxone. And uh, you can take it sooner in most places. You just have to sign, like, a waiver some places do, or they'll just make you say, like, you know, screw it. I need it. I want it now. Give it to me. Some people go in a precip, you know what I mean? And uh, it sucks, you know what I mean? Um, but they usually make you wait, you know, four days or so, sometimes five, like, it's crazy. But uh, the comfort meds, you know, they usually level you out. Um... So, the day comes where you take your Suboxone, right? You're depressed, you're feeling all 
you know, all your emotions, I mean, tears feel like misfires, you know what I mean, like you're crying spells, or if some people do, some people, I don't know. Um, and let's say, you know, you take your Suboxone successfully, they watch you take it, put it under your tongue, wait, 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 they're going to sit there and make sure you don't go into precip, and let's say you're good, right? You're going to be like, oh my god. My temperature, my hands, they're, they're normal. That All the symptoms start to go away, whatever. So then they're going to do, you know, maybe an 8 and an 8, and then a 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 and then done. It depends, too. Some places, they don't do it that long, the, the taper. Um, and now, referring back to the benzodiazepines, what I was trying to say earlier was, it's better to put somebody on a long-acting benzo, like Librium, because most people aren't taking that from doctors. That's usually something they use in detox facilities and hospitals. Um, you know, they're going to, uh, you know, it's better to give like patients that, like I said, because it's like Suboxone for benzos. It's a, a separate benzo. You know what I mean? Cross tolerance. The Xanax or whatever is leaving your system. The Librium you're on just, you know, the, on a taper, but you're not long you know, on it long enough to get physically dependent, so, you know what I mean, they taper you down from that, and then it's like, all right, you know what I mean, that's the best way, but a lot of other places don't do that, they're going to offer you phenobarbital, and that does nothing in benzo withdrawal, absolutely nothing, in my opinion, that was the place, like, when I went down that, to that place in Can, like, near Camden, I, that's all they gave me was phenobarbital, and I was like, like, I, I I, I think I only made it, like, three days there. <laughs> My father picked me up, and uh, the security guard walks me out, right? Comes up to my dad's, because he, he wanted to make sure it wasn't a drug dealer picking me up or something, you know. Takes me to my dad's truck. Sticks his head in my dad's truck's window and goes, Whatever your son tells you about this place, this is the place that ripped me off the Zoloft and stuff and caused hell. He's like, whatever your son tells you about this place, he's not lying. Like, the security guard told him. He's like, please never, ever come back here again. He's like, and I mean that in the most respectful way. And I'm like, my dad's like, well, what happened? He had no idea what was going on yet. And I told him on the way home or whatever. Um, oh, I relapsed. Oh, yeah. After that. <laughs> it was insane. Uh... No, nah, like, so, you know, once you hit, like, on day, like, now this is where stuff gets weird. When you're on, like, day five, day six, you're on your Suboxone taper, or if you're not doing, if it's alcohol, or whatever, you know, you'll, they'll give you Librium, <laughs> you'll sleep right through the whole thing, apparently. I'm not a big alcohol guy, but I, every roommate I've ever had, coincidentally, was, like, an alcoholic, you know, 45-year-old Irishman, every time. Man, this light is bright. Um, so, pretty much, uh, like day five, day six, whatever. That's when your brain switches on you. That's where it does this weird thing where it's like, I feel like I can leave. Like, I, I really don't want to be here anymore. Like, I... I you know, my, my withdrawal's coming to an end, and I feel like maybe I should just, I don't know, and you premeditate it, and a lot of people, they, they don't, like, they, they leave, you know what I mean, they, they think they're confident enough, and they freaking leave, you know what I mean, that always happens around day five and day six, I don't know why, it just always happens, it happens to me, it happens to everybody, I mean, luckily I'm intelligent enough to distinguish the difference between that fluctuation of thought and what I should do. And um, I can o usually override it uh, and keep pushing, but a lot of people, they, they leave. So, um, yeah, like, pretty much try to not do that, you know what I mean? Like, I'm letting you know that now, before any of you go in, that that'll happen. But if you do give it that extra three, four days or whatever, five days, if you do that, I'm telling you right now, you'll be way better off, like, you'll be way better off if you just stick it out, you know what I mean, it's not easy, it's, I, I can't even promise that most of you are even going to be able to, you know, 
Uh, some people, you know, they leave rehab and they just don't detox. I mean, uh, detox. They don't relapse again. You know what I mean? They, they're like, I'm not. I don't want to go through that ever again. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, this part I, I need to I need to tell people against medical advice. AMA. Most places, if you leave. They have a 70, and, and, and this is the weird part. This is where you really need to pay attention. When you're signing into the place and you're getting checked in, the um, whoever it is that's checking you in, the, the tech, whoever, you know, he says, uh, this is just about this and this and that. Yeah, yeah, sign, just sign here, sign here, sign here. Sometimes they don't even tell you anything. They just say sign. And we just sign because we're like, no, no, I'm here. I'm going into detox. I'm going to sign it. And uh, they don't usually, sometimes they don't tell you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But sometimes they'll tell you that if you AMA and you brought your phone and your wallet with you, they're going to have a 72-hour hold on your stuff. So when you leave, you leave with no phone and no wallet or whatever you brought with you. They hold on to all that, except your clothes. But they hold on to those things. They say it's so people don't go out and relapse, but to me, I think that's insanity because I, I, I don't know. Anyway, that's happened to me before. Um, it's not fun. You know what I mean? You're not going to get your stuff back until that time. So that's why I say stick it out. You know what I mean? Um, other than that, you know, residential, when you go to the other side, if you do, uh, it's pretty much like the same thing, except like more meetings, and, uh, you know, it's just more meetings, and I don't know, you get to go outside sometimes, you get to play some sports, you get to, you know, do stuff, you know, more stuff, I, I don't know, it's not super, super different, except, you know, most people, out, they're detoxed over there, they're done, you know, with, with the hard part, um, but some people are, you know, they go to the other side and they're still in withdrawal. And they don't give you withdrawal meds over on the other side. They don't. They give you sleep meds, but that's it. That's all you're going to get. Um, not every place. I mean, some places are different. I'm talking about from what I know, you know. Um, but yeah. So, like, don't, don't freak out too much. You know what I mean? Give it a shot. You know what I mean? Just go in there. <laughs> like, even people that are... <laughs> have been on benzos prescribed their whole life. Go into a de if you really want to get off your benzo, go into a detox center. Let them switch you to another one, you know, to cover your withdrawal symptoms, and drop your tolerance so you can continue. Like when you leave the detox center, you know, you can continue to taper from where you were at. You know, you'd be like, wow, you know, I was on five milligrams of clonopin a day. Now I take one milligram and I'm knocked out for two days. You know what I mean? Like. Your tolerance will lower, and then you can keep tapering. And then if you want, go back to a detox center again. Taper down from there. Get more of the benzo out of your system. And when you leave, you might be able to jump, or you can go down to a tiny, tiny dose and finish your taper. You know, that's another good way to use detox centers. Um, but yeah, it's not always fun. It really, it's not always fun. Uh, you're going to have good and bad moments. You're going to meet good and bad people. Stick by the good ones. Don't listen to the negative conversations. Some people are going to try to get your number. Uh, they're going to say, you know, can you get this on the outside? Like when we get out, don't fall into that. Then there are going to be people you're going to meet that you're never, you're, you're going to be like, where have you been all my life? Like, oh my God, I met my best friend or whatever. And uh, you swap numbers, you leave and you never hear from them again. So it's just the reality of it. And, uh, you know, meetings aren't mandatory in detox, but they are in residential. So, um, you just take what you get from there. You know what I mean? You could be there for freaking six months. When you leave, you're either going to relapse or you're not. But you need to make up your mind while you're there. So, anyway, this was just a quick video about rehab, detox, and, um, what to expect. Um, any comments you want to leave down below, leave them down below. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much how it could, could go, depending on where you go. So, be easy, don't be nervous, just do it, just, just go in, you know what I mean? Try it, what the hell do you have to lose? So, anyway, 
I'll make another video soon, but I needed to make this one. Especially for my buddy, Austin. I uh, wanted you to know, you know what I mean? If you decide, do it. You know what I mean? If you can't do it at home, do it there. Uh, but yeah, don't be nervous, guys. Just do your research on the place before you go. I'll just talk to you guys soon. I'll think of something to make soon. <laughs> All right, guys, have a good day.